One part of sustainable development is to understand the interlinkages of the economy, of society, of the environment, and of our politics and governance processes. And the other part of sustainable development is to do something about it. We will examine over uh, the uh, coming uh, talks two different scenarios for the future of the world. One which I will call business as usual. If we continue more or less on the course that we're on right now, what kind of world we could expect in 10, 20, 30, 40 years? It's not all bad because after all, many wonderful things are happening on the planet. Poverty has been declining. Uh, technologies have been advancing. But there are a lot of risks with business as usual especially in the age of the Anthropocene, especially as we trespass planetary boundaries, especially as we see growth that is not inclusive and leaving large numbers of people behind. So we want to contrast the business as usual or BAU path with a truly sustainable development path for the planet. What would a business as usual path look like? It's not all terrible. Uh, and for many people, especially comfortable people at the top of uh, the income heap, they say business as usual looks pretty good to me. The world economy is expanding. Life expectancy rising, infant and child mortality falling. One could say, not bad. If we get business as usual, no disaster. I think the problem, however, is that that's a little too optimistic a view of what we really face. Sure, business as usual offers more economic growth, but is it fair and inclusive? How many people will be left behind? What will happen in societies, uh, as we saw in Rio, where the favelas, the slums, are right up against uh, the modern uh, uh, and wealthy part of Rio. What happens in those parts of the world really left far behind? Uh, the peasant farmers uh, in drylands facing more and more droughts. Uh, places uh, that find themselves vulnerable to ever more flooding but are too poor to do something about it. We know that all too often the result isn't merely protest, the result can even be violence. And especially what happens if we just go on our merry way uh, thinking that we can produce more, have more cars, burn more coal, oil, and gas, put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, cut down more trees, acidify the oceans, and not respect the planetary boundaries. There I think we're surely going to get our comeuppance in ways that we really are not very clear about right now, certainly not in our broad public discussions, because the environmental dangers are vast. They're so large, they're coming so fast, they're so threatening that they could upend the very process of economic development itself. What seems like a pretty safe course of economic growth could turn out to be evanescent swept away in floods, withering in droughts, in massive heat waves, a loss of quality of life, even a massive loss of production, a growing food insecurity that could threaten the entire world. So business as usual, that's what you see in front of you. Pipelines uh, carrying oil or gas uh, to uh, uh, power plants, to factories, Fossil fuels have been a great uh, part of economic growth ever since the invention of the steam engine powered by coal in England uh, in the 18th century. But by using so much of it, by putting so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, by deranging the climate system, this kind of business as usual poses an enormous threat. Now we've gotten pretty good at finding uh, new sources of natural gas, hydrofracking, new 
uh, sources of oil, new ways to produce oil, such as in Canada's tar sands, a, a place that you see in this picture, crisscrossed by roads, uh, massive use of water and land to dig out uh, this uh, heavy oil that uh, needs a special kind of processing uh, and that, uh, of course, would have a market around the world, but at what cost? At what cost to the environment of Canada, uh, where you see uh, how polluting these processes are? What cost to the world's environment as these tar sands and other fossil fuels are burned in such vast numbers that they derange the climate? Will we see more massive drought in the Sahel, a drought that was so severe covering Chad and Mali and neighboring countries that it led to tremendous amounts of violence contributed to uh, the outbreak of war in Mali uh, and in continuing violence in other places. Uh, droughts like this have affected many parts of the poorest countries. Will we see more of that? And of course, if economic growth is not perceived to be fair, uh, if the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, if the poor feel left behind, cheated by those at the top of the heap, will we see more unrest, more instability? We know it from uh, New York City where we saw the Occupy Wall Street movement to protest against uh, what the protesters called the top 1% and calling for legality and responsibility on Wall Street uh, after the devastation of the 2008 financial crisis. But these street protests weren't just on Wall Street or in other parts of the United States. In Tunis, uh, in 2011, in Cairo, in Athens, in Tel Aviv, Chile, Madrid, Istanbul, Rio de Janeiro, cities around the world there have been growing street protests, protests mostly led by young people, protesting high unemployment, high income inequality, corruption in government, lack of accountability, lack of transparency. Is that the kind of business as usual path that we want? We study sustainable development because we can do better by understanding technology, by understanding the interconnections of economic, social, environmental, and political systems. What you see here is an example of innovation in the Netherlands, one of the most sustainable countries. This uh, innovative uh, building uh, called the Whale uh, is a highly innovative uh, architecture uh, where the tenants uh, enjoy uh, sunlight, open space, uh, and a building has been built uh, in harmony with the natural environment. Half of the world's population today uh, lives in cities. That will rise to perhaps 70% in cities by the year 2030. Vastly more than half of the world's economy is in cities. So a great deal of the path to sustainable development will be through sustainable urbanization, smart cities, smart architecture, smart systems of transport, of power, of water use, of recycling of wastes uh, that cities can achieve when they put their mind to it. Paris, uh, perhaps uh, on everybody's list uh, among the favorite, most beautiful cities in the world, we see the uh, the new uh, innovation of uh, bicycles in the cities. People want to be out uh, bicycling in cities. Massive congestion, massive pollution, uh, not good for our physical health. So walking and bicycling uh, will necessarily become more important technologies of the 21st century. And I'm happy that in cities around the world, there is a return to uh, bicycling using clever shared uh, bicycle systems, new walkways and uh, places where people can improve their health because cities uh, can be uh, places where the obesity epidemic and, and poor health uh, take hold. Uh, in Bogota, uh, there were 
great innovations in using uh, uh, rapid uh, transit in uh, bus systems uh, to move people much more cleanly and effectively uh, than individual car ownership. Uh, and congestion was reduced, pollution was reduced, carbon dioxide emissions were reduced. Another example uh, of how innovation in transportation can make a very big difference for the future. And uh, look at these two examples of so-called self-driving vehicles using the revolutions of information technology. Cars themselves uh, detect uh, other cars, uh, detect pedestrians, uh, and the cars uh, are able not only to drive themselves but to offer uh, a, a much more efficient uh, mode of transport. Well, who knows what technology will bring, but we can see that one of the pathways to sustainable development is through smarter technological systems, converting automobiles from the internal combustion engine, which burns petroleum, to electric vehicles charged by electricity produced by clean energy could be one of the most effective ways to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions in the future. And to get that clean electricity, we need to move off of our addiction to fossil fuels, to coal, oil, and gas, and to move to what technology is now offering, much lower cost and effective harnessing of nature's own energy sources, especially solar power and wind power. In many parts of the world, solar and wind power are already at grid parity. What does that mean? It means that they are already at an economic cost competitive with more traditional fossil fuel based energy systems. Uh, this is a, a picture of a, a solar a thermal concentrator and collector uh, where you see large mirrors set up in a desert region uh, to uh, collect solar power, uh, turn it into energy uh, for electricity production. There are many ways to do it. Uh, it could be photovoltaic cells we'll look at later on. It could be concentrated solar thermal energy where you use the heat that's produced to boil water, to turn uh, steam uh, turbines to produce electricity. Exciting technologies, but what they mean is ways to rid ourselves of the addiction to fossil fuels, which have brought us a modern economy, to be sure, but have now put us in danger because of the rising CO2 levels. And the advances are not only in information technology, better urban design, uh, clever architecture, smarter grids, smarter transport systems, renewable energy, but breakthroughs in agronomy, uh, in biology. Uh, you see here a site testing a new kind of rice, which is bred through special breeding processes to be able to resist flooding, something that obviously will be very important for the farmers in Bangladesh, for example, uh, where this new kind of rice has been shown to be highly effective. Uh, when uh, normal fields are flooded, the rice dies. Uh, but uh, by uh, breeding rice uh, in ways that uh, have what uh, includes uh, gene patterns that allow the rice to survive submergence and flooding, uh, you save lives, improve food security, uh, and find ways to sustainability. So this, at the essence, uh, gives us a hint of what a sustainable development pathway might mean. Business as usual, we know a lot about that, and we see more and more how risky it can be. A sustainable development pathway, the core features of that would be societies that ensure that all parts of the society, girls as well as boys, women as well as men, minorities, all different regions, all children, have access to a healthy start in life, to good nutrition and health care, and especially to the education that they will need to be productive and skilled members of their society, both in 
uh, at the labor force and also as citizens. A good start means uh, inclusion uh, and it means avoiding these mass inequalities of wealth and poverty that afflict the planet. Sustainable development uh, will mean a new kind of urbanization, smarter cities, new transport systems, smarter power grids uh, fed by renewable energy rather than by traditional fossil fuels, new kinds of vehicles, public transportation, or bicycles uh, and walking uh, that can also uh, keep us uh, healthy, new ways to build buildings uh, that are much more energy efficient uh, and much more pleasant and consistent uh, with, uh, with nature. At the essence of sustainable development is problem solving. We have a lot of problems. We're going to need a global effort in a focused and relatively short period of time, a matter of decades, not centuries, to move from the business as usual trajectory to the sustainable development trajectory. And in order to accomplish that, every part of the world will have to be involved in brainstorming, in determining new and creative ways to ensure inclusive and sustainable growth. That's gonna be your job in the coming years, and that's going to be our task uh, in uh, the coming sessions where we investigate uh, what those problems are, what their core features are, uh, and what innovative new design can mean to enable us to choose that path of sustainable development.